Macho Man Randy Savage vs Ricky Steamboat at WrestleMania 3 was an important wrestling match. Not only did the showdown inspire generations of wrestlers, it paved the way for more athletic matches to get featured on big shows and also raised the prestige of the Intercontinental title to new heights as the workers belt. The Savage vs Steamboat showdown wasn't just an entertaining wrestling match, it was a game changer. I'm pretty sure that there's a lot of new fans of wrestling that have heard of the brilliance of Savage vs Steamboat at WrestleMania 3 but haven't had a chance to watch or they just don't understand what the match really meant for professional wrestling. In this video we will look at the build up of the match, exactly why the match itself is so important to wrestling as a whole and also the ripple effect of the match that still continues to this very day. So how did this Shakespearean play of professional wrestling come to be? Along with having an unhealthy obsession over protecting Miss Elizabeth, Randy Savage also had an obsession over the Intercontinental title. Randy managed to capture the IC title on the February 24th 1986 edition of Primetime Wrestling when he defeated Tito Santana for the gold. This would be Savage's one and only run with the Intercontinental title but it sure was a great run. Shortly after winning the title, Savage successfully defended the IC belt against George Steele at WrestleMania 2, with a storyline going into the match based around Steele's infatuation with Miss Elizabeth and Savage being controlling and jealous. After WrestleMania 2, Savage would continue to feud with George Steele. Ricky Steamboat made his WWF debut in 1985, the same year Savage made his WWF debut. Becoming a popular fan favourite, Steamboat quickly rose up the ranks in the WWF after good matches with the likes of Don Morocco, Davey Boy Smith and an incredibly underrated feud with Jake Roberts. Thanks to his hard work and popularity, Steamboat was granted an Intercontinental title match against Randy Savage on the November 22nd edition of WWF Superstars in 1986. Steamboat lost the match by countout but after the match, Savage continued to attack him, leading to Savage injuring Steamboat's larynx with the ring bell. This kicked off the angle between Savage and Steamboat. On the January 3rd 1987 edition of Saturday Night's Main Event, Steamboat returned from his injury and prevented the Macho Man from attacking George Steele like he had done to Steamboat weeks prior. The stage was now set as Ricky Steamboat would be receiving an IC title rematch in the Pontiac Silverdome at WrestleMania 3. During this time period in wrestling, and for years that followed, matches and the spots within those matches were called in the ring. This meant that everything was called on the fly and the match would play itself out based on the instincts of the performers. Sure, the wrestlers would know how the match was going to end and any big mid-match spots would be discussed prior to the bell ringing, but the majority of the match was made up as the stars went along. This was pretty much how wrestling always was, even well into the Attitude Era and beyond. Savage vs Steamboat, however, was planned and rehearsed, move for move, spot for spot. Every intricacy you see in the match, from the stare down to the false finishes, was planned step by step. Ricky Steamboat said, We were using a yellow legal pad and writing down steps, and it got into like 100 something steps. Finally, when we got the match top to bottom, we would then meet and quiz ourselves, and I would say, okay, I'm at step number 55, it's this and this, now tell me the rest of the match. And he, Savage, would go, step number 56 is this, and step number 57 is this. We would go back and forth. So why did Savage and Steamboat want to plan the whole match step by step? WrestleMania 3 was the biggest paying audience to a WWF show until that point. The real attendance without inflation has been quoted as around 78,000. And in 1987, this was a big audience for a wrestling show. Randy Savage wanted the Intercontinental title match against Ricky Steamboat to not only steal the show and not only to be great for this large paying audience, but to be perfect. With Hulk Hogan vs Andre the Giant in the main event, Savage and Steamboat wanted to go out and make a statement while they had all these eyeballs on them. Savage and Steamboat planned the whole match for a total of three months. 
You may also be thinking that, of course, Vince McMahon must have had some sort of input in the match. Mean Gene Okerlund stated that neither Vince nor Pat Patterson had anything to do with the planning and execution of Steamboat vs Savage. Quote Gene Okerlund, I know that Vince and Pat Patterson had a lot of input early on, but somewhere along the line, I believe that Randy Savage and Ricky Steamboat made the final decisions as to what they were going to do on their own. It didn't come from Vince McMahon and it didn't come from Pat Patterson, and look at the product you got out of it. Months of planning had led to this match at WrestleMania. The pair had rehearsed the match countless times in Stamford, along with referee Dave Hebner, who knew every spot, just like Savage and Steamboat. Before the match, Savage and Steamboat gave interviews that highlighted their incredible contrast in styles. Savage was unhinged and wild, while Steamboat was focused on getting revenge on Savage by taking his all-important title belt. The nerves disappeared for both Savage and Steamboat once they made their way down the ring. The sight of the crowd distracted both men from any nerves they may have had. George Steele came to the ring with Steamboat while Macho Man was accompanied by Miss Elizabeth. The two were in the ring and it was time to go. Savage vs Steamboat, bell to bell, went for 14 minutes and 35 seconds, the longest match on the card. During the entirety of the match, there was always motion. Neither man slowed down as the high octane bout just didn't stop to rest. As the match progressed, it seemed that Macho Man was getting the upper hand, playing the crafty heel technician as he took Steamboat apart. Ricky Steamboat would withstand the punishment delivered by Savage and show sparks of hope as he fought back. What was presented here was a masterclass in technical wrestling and high flying athletic moves done at the precise right time, all wrapped up in the storyline of Steamboat seeking revenge and also seeking Savage's title belt. Another thing that stands out about this match is its ability to surprise even the most diehard wrestling fan, especially at the time. False finishes are commonplace in today's wrestling, particularly in main events of big pay per views. They are used to fool us, the viewer, in thinking the match is over, only for a kick out to happen, followed by the massive crowd reaction. Savage and Steamboat had 21 pinfall attempts, but not a single one was wasted on a finisher as each kick out put fans closer to the edge of their seat. This was false finishes done correctly. It made the match feel unpredictable, especially in the time period of when everything that happened in the ring was generally out of habit. You really need to watch the match and try to put yourself in that time period to understand the incredible roller coaster ride that Macho Man and the Dragon put the fans on. Nothing like this, along with the athleticism, the selling and the high octane style of the match, had ever been done before on a grand stage. So how did it all end? Savage inadvertently whipped Steamboat into the referee to knock him out, which left no one to count to three when Randy hit his big elbow drop from the top rope. In a moment of deja vu, Randy went to grab the ring bell. It seemed we were going to yet again see Randy cause serious damage to Steamboat, only for George Steele to prevent him from doing so. As the referee made it back to his feet, Steamboat countered a body slam into a small package to get the three count on Savage. Ricky Steamboat said, I remember laying there, and as I was gathering myself up and Hebner was handing me the championship, my mind was so elated and happy that we did it. It was done, it's over, and we're pretty much on spot with everything that we talked about. Of course I was happy about everything like the crowd reaction and winning the championship, but there was an overwhelming feeling there that it's finally done. The match had gone on exactly as planned, there wasn't a mistake or a misstep to be seen. It had all paid off, and Savage and Steamboat had closed this chapter in their careers. What neither man would know though, is just how impactful the match would be to all who watched it. The whole stealing the show thing at WrestleMania really started here at WrestleMania 3. Steamboat vs Savage was booked as a mid-card match, but in reality, they worked hard to create a memorable match which resulted in making the whole Andre vs Hulk showdown seem more like an attraction than a sporting contest. 
they had set an incredibly high bar for arguably the greatest WrestleMania match of all time, if not one of the greatest matches in wrestling history. And in my opinion, it was because both guys showed they could actually wrestle an exciting match which kept the fans guessing. You can go from Savage vs Steamboat to Austin vs Hart to Undertaker vs Shawn and you will notice the same thing. They all captivated the audience through hard in-ring work and unpredictability. This is exactly what Savage and Steamboat done this night. The match ushered in a new style of wrestling in the WWF where smaller and more athletic guys were given a chance to shine. People like Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho and Rey Mysterio all have a lot to thank Steamboat and Savage for as I really do think without the WrestleMania 3 match we may not have seen these guys in such prominent roles in WrestleMania in the years that followed. It shouldn't be forgotten that the match was also very important in elevating the prestige of the Intercontinental title. It made the belt important and in the years that followed, the belt was used not only as a springboard to the WWF Championship but was also seen as a belt that hard workers held on to. There are exceptions to every rule of course but there's no denying that Savage vs Steamboat really did make the IC title an important and desirable championship. There was never another televised confrontation between the two. Randy Savage was reportedly very interested in working further TV and pay-per-view matches with Steamboat, but Ricky's son was born in 1987 and he asked for some time off. Not only did Ricky give up the chance to work more matches with Randy, he also gave up the IC title to look after his newborn son. When Vince learned that Ricky wanted time off, he had the Honky Tonk Man beat him for the title. Remember, there are exceptions to every rule. In closing, if you haven't seen Steamboat vs Savage, hopefully this video has piqued your interest and you go give it a watch. What you'll be treated to is the setting of a bar in pro wrestling. You'll be viewing a showdown that many wrestlers also watched and drew inspiration from, from young guys wanting to start in the business to veterans who really couldn't believe the amount of planning that went into making this showdown. Sure, it's a match from the 80s, it's from a bygone generation and the athleticism and pace has been surpassed by others, but to really get yourself back in that time frame, try watching all of WrestleMania 1 and 2 and then put on WrestleMania 3 right up until Savage vs Steamboat. You will then see, clear as day, why this match has so many accolades and why the match is considered one of the greatest to ever occur within the squared circle.